Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to be here uh, with you all. We're really excited to be participating with Culture Hub for this year's ReFest. I know we have folks not only on our panel logging in from many different time zones, but I'm sure um, our attendees are also coming in from different time zones. So good morning if you're in LA, good afternoon if you're in New York, and you know, hopefully maybe it's five o'clock somewhere for someone. So um, it's great to be with you all. My name is Isabel Beavers, and I am the artistic director of Super Collider. Uh, and Super Collider is an art, science, and technology collective based in LA. We do exhibitions and programming related to all um, all concepts and issues uh, connected to art, science, and technology. And we're also very much a community building organization. So participating in a dialogue like this, where we're able to partner with UCLA Art Science Center and the SVA BioArt Lab um, is just one of our favorite ways to engage with these many communities. So um, we're happy to be here. And more, Suzanne, thanks so much for co-hosting with us. We're, we're honored to be here with you. Um, so I'll let Suzanne introduce yourself and then I'll talk a bit about our panel today. Great, well, thank you so much and thank everyone for uh, coming on this panel. I think that we have very important topics to discuss. I am the chair of the Fine Arts Department at the School of Visual Arts. And in 2011, I founded our first bio art laboratory. And it's a place that is a combination between a 19th century laboratory and a 21st century. Uh, we have uh, animals and plants. We do molecular types of investigations. And the idea behind it is to use the tools of science at this time when biology is technology to make art. So although we are not a science course, um, what happens in our classes or our residency is conversations turn towards altering nature and the philosophical debates regarding that. <clears throat> Fantastic. And that's such a great jumping off point to think about sort of our topic um, today. Well, I was speaking with Maddie at Culture Hub about this year's theme, which is related to uh, the idea of renew. So critically examining our culture's obsession with newness. Um, and a question that the theme asks is how can we prioritize ancestral knowledge and forgotten technologies in order to renew our relationship to creation and innovation? Um, and I thought this was just the perfect um, entry point for us to have a dialogue around the idea of new. I noticed a lot of the artists we're working with this year at Super Collider, as well as artists at um, ArtSci and SVA BioArts Lab are inherently calling upon strategies that exist outside of the normative capitalist colonialist paradigm to, to think in new ways, um, but are also resisting the idea that newness essentially and inherently means progress and linearity. So the artists that we have on the panel today are all working in various media and their artistic and research practices. And I think approaching this topic from interesting, oblique and, and new ways. Um, so before we jump into some of our questions and dialogue around this topic, um, We'll have each of the artists present today just introduce themselves, um, a quick bio, but also introduce themselves through their work so that you all have a bit of context for the ways in which um, we're thinking and, um, and, and practicing around this very topic. So we'll start off with Nicholas, or excuse me, Juan uh, Villanueva. Juan, would you like to? Introduce yourself and just let me know when to slide over to the next image. Sure. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Juan Villanueva. I'm a second generation florist and gardener, uh, originally from South Texas, uh, but I'm also an artist. Um, so, coming out of the SVA residency from last uh, summer, I was asked to create a piece, uh, floral suspended arrangement. Um, and uh, what I was really concentrating on uh, during the residency was this idea of um, 
you know, my identity as a, uh, as a Tejano and uh, thinking back to the period of the pandemic when people were looking for uh, ways to heal. Uh, and so a lot of the work that I did at the residency was about healing. Um, and then thinking back to my grandmother uh, who practiced curanderoism, curanderismo. And so that uh, brought me to the piece. And so that's particularly what this piece is about is kind of a, a lost knowledge that I had. Uh, she had a, suffered a stroke when I was in high school. So all of that knowledge that she had and those practices are basically lost. And so kind of re-examining those and, and how uh, and what that means to me now uh, in terms of uh, my art practice and uh, kind of my floral design moving forward. And so this first image is kind of the ceremony piece that's on the bottom uh, of this suspended arrangement. And so if we can switch over to the, uh, the full scale. So this is the suspended arrangement. A lot of this material is our products that I would have in my normal floral practice. And so it's uh, basically the idea of kind of like upcycling those materials to a fine art medium and um, continue that conversation. So a lot of the elements in there are elements that I've collected throughout uh, the years. Some of them are from my childhood, some of them are from now, and they kind of all relate to that same story of um, this history that's been ripped out of uh, our culture. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so interesting and I love, I love this idea of re-examining these lost practices and, and healing from that re-examination, something we'll certainly come back and touch back on um, during our dialogue. Thank you so much, Juan. Uh, next, Kira Sonica. Hello, everyone. My name is Kira Sonica. I'm a writer, artist, technologist, and in my work, I explore the connections between futurism, AI collaboration, Transqueer temporalities, global north south dynamics, indigenous sovereignty, and the internet. Um, and what I'm presenting today is a series of AI collaborative works, um, which have been a result of training AI into Guarani symbologies and also historical trans and queer aesthetics to sort of create and reimagine a future that celebrates and honors the expansiveness of our regalia uh, to counteract the necropolitical legacies that we have seen and witnessed, um, uh, in particular, the intersection of this uh, identities and social groups globally. And for me, I am very, I've always been very interested in exobiological ecosystems and the potential for metamorphosis. Um, during the Middle Ages uh, was really a time when uh, multiple institutions, in particular the religious institution of Catholicism, uh, installed the Abrahamic notion of hybridation, hybridity to pathologize uh, gender diverse people and people from uh, non-heterosexual uh, orientations um, to, you know, discriminate um, and really start uh, that legacy. Uh, and these ideas went then explored through colonialism and still inform the state of geopolitics and geoeconomics today. Um, so my work is interested in reclaiming hybridity as power, as for many indigenous cultures, uh, and particularly my Guarani ancestrality, is interested in connecting with this other forms of um, uh, with with multiple species and different and multiple forms of intelligence, uh, and learning from their strengths, uh, and reimagine, us uh, reimagine this through uh, multiplicity, multimodalities of bodies, and through symbiosis. Wonderful. 
Well, well that's very, very interesting. I really appreciate um, what you said and, and also the real aesthetic quality of these images. I think that there's a fabulous color palette here of luminescence and um, we are clearly into the science fiction realm because uh, we are living uh, science fiction personalities at this point. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Kara. And next, um, Nicholas Del Castillo. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Nicholas. Um, I am a fourth year senior at SBA. I'm actually currently in the bio lab right now. Um, I am a queer artist from Miami, Florida. Um, I am a taxidermist and my work is about recontextualizing taxidermy. That's what my thesis is about. It's about examining an old art form, something that has a lot of history, um, a, a lot of like complicated history involving colonialism and conservation and taking it and trying to look at it from a new lens and finding a place for taxidermy in the 21st century. Um, I also focus on addressing queer issues and other kinds of personal issues about, about queerness and transness using a transformative art form. So it's definitely about analyzing something from history and kind of recontextualizing it by using, by incorporating new materials or new processes such as using hide as a silk screening surface or a painting surface or incorporating materials such as ceramics or biomaterials um, to, in order to recontextualize it and place it in a new kind of environment. Great. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you, Nicholas. And Thank you. It's also so interesting to see the, <clears throat> the various um, materialities that we're working with from highly technological sort of rendered image making to the very hands-on physical processes. So, um, which also very much connects to this idea that we're approaching of regeneration and approaching newness in a sort of cyclical rather than linear way. So, so many interesting things to touch back on. Um, next, I'll pass it to Ivana. And Ivana, I believe is going to share around screen. So I hope you can see this. Um, I'm gonna, um, thanks for having me here. It's a really interesting group and I'm enjoying seeing everyone's work. Um, I'm currently in a graduate program at Yale University in School of Arts uh, in the sculpture program here. And um, parallel, I'm working in the Art Science Center as assistant director at UCLA, which was my um, school where I did my uh, bachelor degree and I almost like don't like to separate the work from like kind of being in school and vice versa and also from the practice too so I find that my um, the work that I do for Arts Science Center is extension of my practice and kind of like a place where I get inspiration and sources and connections to communities and people, um, which is part of the um, today's panel as well. Uh, I'll briefly talk about one of my recent projects uh, that's called Audible Silence. In this project, I used a vacuum pump um, to remove the air from two vacuum chambers. And inside of vacuum chambers, I placed air raid sirens um, that are turned on and they're really loud sirens used to signal bombing in my hometown in Belgrade, Serbia. Um, so I was interested in um, like what does it mean to bring these objects uh, that are almost like um, um, almost like a historical object from my country, bringing them to U.S. territory. So I started like kind of rethinking this idea of like what does it mean to play this specific sound again in a new context. Uh, so I started thinking about um, the idea of silencing in these environments where. If there is no air, the air, the sound cannot travel, so it's fully um, silent uh, piece. And then on the very right side of the the box, I placed the controller that would let the air in every 15 minutes, so the air slowly comes in back in the boxes, and you can hear the sirens ringing again for a second, and then it closes again, and um, and the air is removed uh, from the boxes again. So most of my work deals with sound and in relationship to sonic memories and um, 
these kind of like post-traumatic experiences that I had as a child of growing up in um, like very like war-torn country. Um, but I'm like looking into the future of these objects and kind of like uh, rethinking the, the structure of them. So I'm very excited to be here. Oh, great, great piece. And I think that sound permeates our entire body in ways we're not even aware of. I think that when we hear certain sounds, we react intuitively, whether it is a siren or a cat's meow or um, even any kind of music. Um, I think there is something about sound that is so primal, and I think that you're addressing that in your work. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ivana. And last but certainly not least, I'll pass it to Alice. Hey, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, I'm an artist and writer from London and LA. I'm currently in London, so it's evening my time. <laughs> um, and my work is primarily based inside of game engines and deals a lot with questions around speculation and speculative futures, but also thinking about speculation as a tool for looking both forwards and back in time. So of course, I'm very interested in this idea of nonlinear time or thinking about newness in perhaps an alternative way. Um, I would also say that in addition to thinking about newness, like, um, People are also very obsessed with the concept of an end or like a singular ending or like an apocalypse, let's say. And that's certainly true in the conditions of like science fiction, which a lot of us are borrowing from or referencing in our work. So maybe that's something we could also talk about of this, this kind of obsession with like end times, which we've all sort of felt certainly in the pandemic. But of course, this idea of a singular ending being a quite colonial concept in and of itself something certainly worth problematizing. Um, so yeah, let me just go ahead and share my screen. I'll just present uh, one work. Um, and like I said, all this stuff I make is in game engines. It's typically taking the form of machinima. So um, video work uh, filmed inside of a game engine. Um, and this project I'd like to introduce you to is a project I made last year called The Martian Word for World is Mother which is a reference to the Ursula K. Le Guin short story, The Word for World is Forest. And I'll just zoom in on this image really fast. Um, so, you know, in, in principle, the, the work is exploring these three potential Martian worlds, uh, some of which deal very critically with the question of like the aesthetics and the architecture of um, these sort of colonial fantasies for inhabiting or in, in some sense controlling or transforming the, the surface of Mars. Um, it's also dealing a little bit with like space law and the tricky sort of loopholes in um, space politics and the sort of international law we have for outer space right now, which is a very murky gray zone. So a lot of the time my work kind of slips between speculation and research that spans um, disciplines ranging from anthropology to architecture to linguistics. Um, and this project is certainly dealing a lot with language. And it's really focusing on um, the idea that we can't really think about a future or um, a framework in which another planet kind of exists beyond our own interests, because like all of the language that we have to describe outer space and to describe even other forms of life is fundamentally anthropocentric in nature. So the project was really looking at a sort of building a sort of alternative language system or structure in which um, Mars or indeed any other planet or um, point in the universe can sort of exist beyond human regulation or human control or human fantasies, uh, whether that's colonizing a planet or uh, rewilding a planet. So yeah, uh, just show you briefly what that means like in the context of this project. Um, let me see if I can find it really fast. Um, the, the project that basically centered around building this, this non-human language structure uh, using a, a combination of uh, fictional languages on Earth as well as um, uh, 
uh, dying languages, uh, Scottish Gaelic in particular. So uh, it took these two different languages, this like speculative Martian language from the 19th century and Scottish Gaelic, and then also merged it with the sound of wind um, that we've captured on Mars's surface and also the sound of wind in um, Antarctica. So the idea was to sort of create an ecosystem that spoke its own language system that sort of went beyond human understanding, kind of challenging the idea of language as this communication strategy or tool, and also thinking about um, the way in which maybe not understanding or, or not speaking the language of another being, ecosystem or entity could potentially be a way of descaling um, like an anthropocentric understanding of what language is or what it's good for or what it can do. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my little speech and I'll stop there. Okay, I'd like to add a couple of things to that. Um, I was listening to the news this morning and it appears that China is now in the um, innovative stage of going to the moon and creating rapid prototype bricks from the soil to make housing for astronauts uh, who will eventually live there. Um, another thing about outer space is that the kind of conditions uh, that we have on Earth are totally different in outer space. So that if you plant a seed in outer space, you get two sprouts instead of one, which revolutionizes the whole notion of what biology is. If you boil water in outer space, you get one giant bubble instead of the lots of little ones. So this idea of astrobiology uh, and all of the questions concerning the colonization and the politics around that, I think is very much on the forefront right now um, of many of the leaders of the world. Absolutely. And I think that's a really nice sort of segue into one of the questions I'm thinking about, which has to do with time and scale and space, but also tools and the ways in which our tools allow us to understand or know or conceptualize of something in a different way. Um, I think so about some readings I've done on really early, picking back up on science fiction, really early writings in science fiction, and the generation of certain tools like the telescope um, and the microscope allowed humans for the first time to see things in a, an entirely different scale. And it spurred all of this imagination around what could be an um, storytelling around the unknown based on the tools that allowed us to see things in another way. So my question to the panelists is, in thinking about the tools of your own practices from game engines to ancestral practices, to ritual practices, um, to sort of recontextualizing um, aesthetic identities and how those relate to um, the way folks have been treated throughout history. Could you speak a bit about the tools you have found in your practice that allow you this alterity or this way of knowing or understanding outside of the normative paradigm? And all of you have touched on this a bit already in your intro, but to, to maybe just speak to that a little bit more specifically, because I think that's something so interesting and unique about each of your practices are sort of the set of tools you're using to formulate a language in your work. I could answer. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think for me, at least in my practice, the, the way that I've been able to kind of do that is by like thinking about the complete opposite of that specific topic. So for taxidermy, I think about like all the different utilitarian functions and all the different materials that go into it, like the forms, the forms that are sculpted and commercially bought and reproduced. And I think about how, what kind of material can I use to contrast against that, that can not only change the context of it in terms of what it's used for and how it's presented, but also how it can be 
easily read by someone who doesn't really understand the process and how they can grasp that just by looking at it in a different material. Um, so one of the projects that I did was turning ceramic, turning um, utilitarian foam taxidermy forms into ceramic because now it's not just a utilitarian object that goes inside of something that you don't usually see. It's now an object in and of itself and it's gonna be like a decorative object or a precious object because ceramic has that other history. So you're combining two different materials with two different histories to tell a new story. Same with the biomaterials. You can use a biomaterial to replace something that historically has a different meaning, but you're, since you're using something new, it immediately connects to an audience that it's an, serving a new purpose. I think that's so interesting. And I love this idea of that. So that and one thing that I've definitely thought about a lot with your practices is that the, the newness comes from a regeneration and sort of like a recycling um, and also a, a composite or collaging of various practices and materialities. Um, thank you for sharing that. Juan, yeah, would you like to share? Um, so I think kind of uh, for me, piggybacking on what uh, was talking about was Kind of this idea, again, I think that all of my recent focus has been uh, on coming out of that pandemic and kind of like those traditions. And so I see that a lot of those similarities in um, how particular plants uh, and um, floral product has been reinterpreted or become more popular, particularly in my field, like everybody was looking for eucalyptus. It was like getting sold out because of uh, a lot of its healing properties and, and that sort of thing. And so seeing plants uh, and flor flowers that are um, getting reintroduced to the populace and rethought of, um, whereas a few years ago, no one would have really thought of eucalyptus. It was thought of as kind of like a common filler um, or background uh, plant or flower to be used. and and now because of all of the healative properties that are being acknowledged, it's very popular. Um, and that, that kind of goes throughout the course. I mean, things like Sage and the Palo Santo that was just getting sold out, like you couldn't find any of those elements, um, I think really speaks to, again, the, uh, the reinterpretation of those kind of ancestral uh, technologies that, um, that we've found especially after the pandemic. Uh, well, I think I'll pick up on that um, with a new question. I've been wanting to, an, uh, to ask this question for a while because I'm um, an avid gardener. And during the pandemic, um, I photographed all the things that I planted on about two acres of land and have made about 80 collages of all of those things. And one of the things about a garden that I'm going to open this discussion about is shall we uncolonize a garden? Because if we look at ethnobiology, you see that people who are migrating to another place like to bring their seeds or their plants with them. Uh, ethnobiologists sort of tried to find out the ur, the original uh, plant, and sometimes have a hard time doing that. But in my garden, I have I have things that are non-native, okay? I have native plants and I have non-native plants that may come from Madagascar or whatever. So how do we look at hybridity in terms of colonization as a way to meld these two issues? I can pick up on uh, this uh, very difficult question, which is <laughs> almost <laughs> philosophical. Uh, but I, I really can relate to that because I was growing, um, I grew up in very like urban environment in Belgrade and Serbia. And then in some time of my adulthood, I lived in uh, Topanga in California. And I started growing my own garden and started thinking kind of like similar to you, like, oh, these native plants are thriving 
thriving in this environment, but I also brought some plants from Serbia and they're also doing well. And um, also seeing like the vegetables and fruits in relationship to animals that are on that, um, a lot of wild animals that were trying to get um, my garden. I was like really working hard on protecting things. And then it was like this relationship of like making, producing, uh, and also being in this kind of like, kind of like power structure position instead of like, realizing that it's like all that we're all the same and we're all kind of like it's a very difficult um question and i'm wrapping my thoughts around everything because the the i believe personally that beauty comes in diversity and that the idea of like having specific like now it's harder to have seeds that are original or that are native and we work on almost like use technology to to get there but the world changes so much and like the idea of like people's migration and like borders and like us kind of blending all over the world is kind of like these seeds that we're bringing around so the government controls over seeds that you you when you're coming to the united states you can't legally bring the seeds from other countries mm-hmm. or you can't legally bring the plants is really interesting to me because it, it limits it, like all these things that are reflected as like things that are not working in society, like immigration laws are reflected in the laws for plants. And now we have like massive problems of um, not just genetically modified seeds, but one type of seeds for each plant. Uh, so diversity and variety of plants are kind of like going down because of that, because only the plants that are thriving in certain environments are surviving. Um, but even the plants that are not as like delicious or producing enough are bringing a lot good in future generations. So they would maybe not be really beneficial this year, but maybe next year they're bringing something else. So I think it's like this ongoing, uh, almost like a circle of life that we have to look from a little bit further perspective. Uh, so I really do like the idea of like unpacking the colonial structure. And I think it's a very difficult question. Yeah. Where a lot of communities have issues. So I'm really looking for other answers too. Yeah, I just to add to that, I mean, I feel like um, it's also a really interesting question when you think about it from like a multi-species perspective. Um, for instance, when I was in Los Angeles, I guess that was a month ago now, um, I was staying near Elysian Park. Um, and while I was there, I was really intrigued to notice all of these kind of um, experiments um, with native planting in the park um, as a way of sort of bringing back the local Southern California ecology, or at least the, the plant ecosystem that used to be there before people showed up. And um, I mean, for instance, like the agave plant um, is a non-native species, but nowadays walking around the city, you see it almost everywhere. And the person behind the, um, or one of the people behind the organization that's behind this native planting experiment um, was sort of saying it it gets a little tricky when you think about it from the perspective of many of like the hummingbird species that exist and populate um, in Southern California, because for them, this non-native species is actually a huge source of nutrition um, and water and like kind of where they get a lot of their uh, life reserves from. So it's like a tricky question then, like because if you're thinking about um, a, a movement or a motion to uh, decolonize a certain landscape or to, to remove non-native planting, if that, if that non-native planting actually uh, is, has been kind of um, acclimated to by the native species that live there, it's like, then you kind of start thinking about, okay, if I remove this one plant, that's a really good source of nutrition for um, a hummingbird, then am I sort of damaging or destroying the the other aspects of the ecosystem that maybe extend beyond um, human-made systems of like legal import-export complexities with non-native species or concepts of, um, yeah, like colonialism. So I think it's it's like an interesting question when it's seen through the, the lens of like a, a multi-species perspective. Yep. Anybody else? 
I'll go back to Ivana's discussion about the um, the seeds, which are now have a terminator genome in them. So whereas you once could plant a, plant a seed, plants, it goes to seed, you collect the seeds and you use them again for the next year. Well, that does not happen in most cases. I don't know if you are aware of the fact that the chemical companies after the 1960s or so bought up all the seed companies so that instead of having the chemicals sprayed onto the seeds, they are now in the seeds. So if you think about whoever owns the seeds, owns the food supply, and that becomes this next question about, um, about the property rights of living or um, potentially living things. So this is another really big question. <clears throat> Could you rephrase that a bit, Suzanne? So I'm following that. So what are the, how can we think about property rights in relationship to other? To living, to live, to living species, okay. So uh, I'll, <laughs> let's use GMOs as an example. Those are copyrighted, they're patented rather. Mm. They're patented seeds. If you, if one blows on your farm, and produces a plant, you could get sued even though you had nothing to do with this. Um, the, also, there have been many companies going down to indigenous regions in South America, picking out plants and patenting them. So this, this, is, this is like a very serious question as to uh, whether what are the next steps? We have Onco Mouse, which is a patented mouse, among other mice. Uh, when will it be, is it too far to reach that human beings will be patented? Um, I'm not sure, okay. <laughs> I can add on to this. Um, I think that this is just like, obviously I don't agree with patenting plants or humans or animals or anything like that. I think like even just patenting a plant is too far. Like I obviously think that most of the stuff is going too far, but this is just like another aspect of capitalism and how it's really like destroying everything because this can apply to so many other things. But when it comes to like a plant or an animal, something that's probably been around longer than we have, how can you even patent that? Like, how can you patent something that either has existed before you or other cultures have been using before you that like just doesn't make sense to me and I think the human beings thing is also interesting to bring up with like the idea of like genetically modifying people to have different appearances mm -hmm. um which is I don't I don't know how often that actually happens I know I've just heard about it I don't know I haven't done like an insane amount of research into it but who says that they can't patent people that are designer babies who are born who didn't even make that choice to do that like who knows that what could happen yeah yeah i th i think this ties in there was sorry kira where did you were you about to speak oh yeah i just wanted to comment something uh i think that this question of authorship and ownership it's, it's very interesting as it brings you know is is this again this the replication of this hierarchical and sort of anthropocentric way of viewing things and obviously this is connected to um histories of coloniality and the ways in which you know uh there was ownership of of humans in the past and and you know um across multiple geographies um so when it comes down to plants and animals, uh, it makes me think of, uh, you know, uh, what do these operations, um, what, what are the impact of these operations uh, in the long term and how do we see that 
uh, in relation to, you know, technology and perhaps AI. And it, it just brings up more questions. Good point. Yeah, Juan. Uh, yeah, so uh, at the residency at SBA, I did do a piece, uh, a smaller piece about uh, that exact topic. Uh, it was a piece called uh, Patent Pending Earth. And so it was basically individual packets of different soil samples, and some had mycelia, some had moss, uh, some had uh, other type of planting material in them. But yeah, it was definitely engaging in the exact same conversation as to uh, where does ownership lie and then who is able to afford those, uh, those patented products in the end. If we keep going down that line, it really just becomes a, another tool um, for the elite to kind of marginalize communities. And so it was the satirical take on uh, all the patenting that is being done. And I think the, we've all heard about things like corn and that sort of thing. Um, but during our discussions on uh, growing mycelia and that sort of thing, that kind of like really grabbed me because the, the broad scope of what mycelia is used in the natural world is it, it really, it, it kind of covers everything. And so when you start getting into patenting things like that, uh, I think uh, we get into some really uh, murky areas and uh, start getting into some dangerous areas really quickly. I was just hoping to add uh, one, um, like one more comment to, in relationship to like human body and modifying your human and like future of that. I'm really um, like interested in like new research that's coming out, for example, and they found out at Stanford University that Asian Greece, uh, Greeks were intentionally blinding, blinding themselves, um, like Asian Greek poets, uh, so they can, if they lose, they realize that if they lose the vision, that they will be able to think better about the language, because the same part of the brain responsible for vision is also responsible for language. So if you take one out, then the brain is able to kind of open synapses and uh, bridges like, um, wider and you're able to think uh, about the language in more complex ways. Um, so that really like kind of like started, uh, made me think like in all the generations and like bringing, uh, bringing good and bad. So if someone loses a vision, gains something else. If uh, someone not just loses, but if someone is born with something lacking or something, it's actually giving a benefit to a future uh, generation. And that's something that really scares me about genetically modifying humans and using CRISPR to kind of modify all these things that can um, be seen as like, um, you know, like something that we would all want to fix instantly. Yes, we all should have vision, but there is actually benefit of bringing something in like a longer evolutionary way and bringing something to a future uh, generation. So um, I'm really curious in like, um, in that, era of like CRISPR technology that can like kind of like change and modify things. I'm all for it, but if that's your choice is, uh, that you make consciously and you, for example, if I uh, do any CRISPR changes on my muscles today, that wouldn't affect the future generation. Um, but if I do it in, in a sense of like, if my parents decided on my embryo and to do it, that would affect the future generation. So, Kind of curious in that relationship of like who has decision and um over the the kind of like future look of the body well i i think it's a very complex question and the philosopher jürgen habermas wrote a book called the future of human nature and i would recommend this uh to everyone because a lot of the things we're talking about um, the idea that your parents may think that by doing X, Y, and Z to you would be what you want, but you have no agency in that decision. So, um, but these are some of the future that, that are, we are embarking on. 
And um, I think I think it's critical that we become more knowledgeable in these areas. Yeah, and, <clears throat> excuse me, I got picked off for a minute, but um, I caught some of the end of what you were just saying, Suzanne, but so much of what we're talking about now <clears throat> to me seems to relate to the colonial project and the notion that control that first of all that we have control and that control can gain this idea of progress that we keep coming back to in particular with a, a notion that we could control the future and of course we're always making decisions and putting practices into place that that might influence or um, most likely will impact the future in one way or another but I think this comes back to um, a really interesting um, mechanism of the notion of control and also how we can control the finitude of this world for our own futures. Um, and this reminds me of what Alice was was saying um, during the intros um, with the obsession we also have with endings or finitude or the um, what what might come to an end or run out. Um, so I wonder if we could speak a bit also about the anthropocentrism inherent within that. Outside of humans, the world has what it needs to regenerate and to go on and to replenish. Um, and the sort of human colonial project would like to interfere with those mechanisms. So I would love uh, to hear what the panelists are thinking around this idea of finitude and endings and um, the cyclical nature that we so often are interrupting with our our actions. Yeah, Juan. Yeah, so I don't, um, I think that for me, uh, a lot of the, my practice, at least in gardening, is just leave it alone, like let it do its thing. It knows better than we do a lot of times in terms of you know, how to heal itself and how to take care of itself. And I feel like there is a lot of pressure a lot of times to kind of put our will onto a thing as opposed to letting it be and, and letting nature uh, run its course. And so kind of for me, uh, I think that sometimes just letting things go and run their natural course it is sometimes best. And like I said, in my practice for in my gardening is just like letting the garden be as naturally uh, progress as naturally as possible without trying to feel like I have to be doing something to it all the time, which is like adding fertilizer or de-weeding or whatever the case might be um, and letting it take more of a natural cycle. Um, that's just my stance on that. This makes me think of how in the pandemic, uh, for example, in China, pollution decreased significantly uh, when people were in lockdown. Um, and, you know, this has happened uh, in many places of the world as well. And how, you know, you can see really how... Uh, on the one hand, the impact of human intervention and uh, industrialism, but also uh, just adding to what Juan was saying uh, about timelines and this obsession with uh, the confinement, the confinement that time can represent uh, and how, you know, earth itself is regenerative um, and sometimes is, just best to you know stop thinking of the ways in which we can improve certain things or because I feel like a lot of the technology advancements that we have had are very concerned with constantly improving and cons and accelerating and you know uh, reaching that next evolutionary steps and sometimes it's really just about letting things be Yeah, kind of going off of that, um, one thing that I was thinking about and uh, 
a project, I guess, that I stumbled on when I was doing the research for the Mars project um, was a project called Planetary Personhood. And it's by a Swiss, I believe, or maybe Swedish German collective called Non-Human Nonsense. And um, the idea behind it was taking this conversation that's been happening recently on Earth around environmental personhood um, or the idea of prescribing uh, certain geographical, let's say like bodies of water or like a mountain, um, the status of personhood in order to protect it. And the project Planetary Personhood was basically saying, why don't we extend this technique or tactic to other planets? such as Mars, like could giving Mars the status of a person protect it from the Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk type folks <laughs> out there? Um, and that was something to me that was like, I mean, it, like it's a website, so you can explore it if you're interested. I think it's just called planetarypersonhood.com. Um, but yeah, this, this question around like, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about patenting and like whether that's patenting seeds or bodies, like we've talked about it at the kind of individual character scale, but then when we scale it up to systems, like entire ecosystems or an entire body of water, um, you know, that might otherwise be polluted or um, destroyed in some capacity by human, by human hands, um, is, is really the best thing we can do in that framework is kind of reasserting the primacy of the human as the ultimate um, qualifier of, of protection? Like, do we give these things the status of personhood in order to not further fuck them up by human activities? Like, is, is this kind of you, like, subverting in a sense um, this primacy of the human, like really like the best tactic or is it just like a point of subversion that's maybe leading us away from critiquing or probing like a much larger structural like problem or system. So that's something that I'm thinking about a lot these days. And I'm curious like what the rest of you all think. Can I add on this just real quick? Um, uh, so there, there, there's always been a lot of conversation around the potential of AI cognition and the potential of anti-human AI cognition. And um, yesterday I was talking uh, with my roommate about some research that's been going on about and speculative research uh, around, you know, what happens if, for example, AI one day decides not to, you know, write what you tell it to write or generate what you, want it to generate um and you can only grant agency through learning them about consent um and yeah i th i think it's it's a very interesting question uh and perhaps there needs to be a deep dive on that Well, I, I think the Scandinavians are much more advanced than we are. I know that there are zero carbon footprints in Iceland and I think Denmark. And so this question of protecting natural resources, which belong to everyone, because you can't shut the door on, um, on a country, really. Um, I, I think that that in America, you know, the corporate culture has um, created a situation with fossil fuels to begin with that uh, continually do damage. And unless there is a real effort uh, by our politicians, then uh, we are going to be in very serious trouble. I'm just pointing to a few things in the chat. One said, I feel personally some things you can't walk back. Maybe a matter of taking that pause and becoming more mindful about how we move forward. And I think this might be a great time to transition to a question that came through the chat that relates to what you were just speaking to, Suzanne. 
which nice. is um, from Sneha Ganguly. I'm hoping I pronounced your name correctly. Can we truly intentionally rehabilitate our gardens, environment, and landscape if we don't rehabilitate our relationship and support folks native to Turtle Island? Is it enough to assimilate to new information, but not preserve the true bearers of culture? Nicholas. I actually like really like this question because I think this question can be applied to a lot of different things about um, making art about something and using your voice as an artist to talk about something. But then there's a group of people, there's communities that still need support and still need to be uplifted. And I do think that it's important for people, for anyone to make art about important subjects, what, whatever that subject may be about, because it brings awareness to it. But I think we have to do, like, I think as artists, one of the most important things we can do is find people from those communities or from those environments, from those cultures to get their words and their voices out and even their work, even have them collaborate or participate in an art piece and, you know, get from, get from the source. Um, I think that's a really good question. I really like that question. Right. So Isabel, do you think we should begin wrapping this up? Um, I think that the discussion has been very fruitful and has raised a lot of important issues that need further explanation. So um, maybe a follow-up to this at some point uh, would, would be great. I think that everyone had very um very critical um opinions um from various perspectives mm -hmm. and i think it's also important not to develop um an expected kind of dialogue mm -hmm. that it's time to sort of throw some foul balls uh mm -hmm. into into the the game here because that's sort of the wake up call <laughs> Absolutely. And I agree so much, so many rich, um, so much food for thought has been brought up and these conversations and dialogues always for me are really just the, like they initiate so much in my own mind. So yeah, it's been wonderful to share space with all of you and listen to all of your practices and thoughts. And um, everyone here has such an, an a, a rich practice that we could easily spend hours talking about everyone's work, but um, being able to be together for this, that this time was really wonderful and so grateful to Suzanne and everyone here for sharing your thoughts and your work with us. Um, I took a lot of notes, so there's going to be a lot of things I'll be researching after this today. Great. <laughs> All right. It was great to meet everybody that I don't know. And if anybody who I don't know is coming to New York, uh, please let me know and come for a visit to the BioArt Lab. It's really a place of wonder. Okay. Absolutely. And uh, and thanks, Culture Hub. I know ReFest is happening still in New York this whole week, and the Los Angeles ReFest will be happening um, next weekend. So come see us there. And yeah, thanks all so much. Have a great, great week. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It was a great time. Thank you. Thanks so much.